Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Lewis. At the end of a week when America has a new president and the General Assembly gets down to work in an election year session, we are glad to host our editorial roundtable on what matters. In the space that is normally occupied by Brian Kerwin, who is traveling this week, we are happy to have columnist and former talk show host Pat Murphy joining us this week. Vivian Page joins us as well from the other side of the political spectrum. Don Lozado joins us from the Virginian pilot and a little later. Later in the broadcast, we'll check in with Daily Press legislative reporter Kimball Payne, who is actually on the job in Richmond, which explains why he's not at the round table tonight. Good to have you all with us. Thank Good you for being here. here. Don Lozado, last time we talked, you were very cagey about whether the pilot was going to name you as the uh, replacement, although none could replace Dennis Hartig. No, uh, none The could. one who stepped up in the next line of succession as editorial page editor. Very cagey you were. And well, I didn't know. Uh -huh. I, I didn't know. The decision had not been made. You remember so how cagey I, you I, were. I, I, I would never lie to my friends at the table. It, I thought it was the worst. <laughs> The worst lie he'd yes. ever told. I, I, mean, I, I, I emailed him and said, "Don't play poker." Exactly. <laughs> He's not yeah, a good he plan for you. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm very honored. It's a, it's quite a responsibility. Yes, Glad it to is. Be there. And what is different about being an editorial writer and being the editorial page editor? My schedule is no longer my own. Uh -huh. um, my days are very full, but it is a it's a remarkable honor to be sure. sort of the shepherd of this great conversation. So. Well, you know, it's interesting too because uh, this week, of course, <clears throat> we uh, we are beginning the commemorations of the 50th anniversary of the end of massive resistance. And I was m noting this week uh, that uh, one of your predecessors, mm -hmm. uh, one of the Pulitzer for the reporting and the editorial writing that took place around that particular time in our history. Yeah, it was so, Lenore Chambers, yes. who was the editor in, in 59, and we have, I mean, we have one of his editorials the, the year that Virginia closed the schools on our wall as a reminder of what, both what to aspire to and what can be accomplished. I so mean, it is a heritage, no question about it. It is. It's a, it is a remarkable heritage. Well, you would have been our choice and we're happy for you, so thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. Thank you very Largely much. Largely because we like to think of ourselves as kingmakers around here. That's, <laughs> that's how I'm talking about it. Uh, Pat Murphy, good to have you with us good tonight. To be here. Everything, uh, everything well with you? You're writing for the Virginia News Source. Source. Yes. And uh, are you one of those uh, people who, who posts your comment on the pilot's editorials or do you reserve your commentary for that? I, I reserve it for yeah. one one fell swoop and no I don't I, I do read I read Vivian's uh, blog but I read the blogs but I don't post on them. Okay all right. I got enough of that doing talk shows <laughs> for 20 years yes. that I do. Yeah. yeah and of course now you're having to read every comment that's there now. I mean you probably already did that though. Yeah, no comment. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's that face again. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, what a week it's been. Uh, we had, of course, the inauguration of Barack Obama in Washington, D.C., and Vice President uh, Joe Biden. Vivian, you were there? No. You were not there? No. But you were thinking about going, were you? I thought about it, yeah. and I actually, as a, uh, one of the delegates of the National Convention, we, uh, they actually had, gave us all tickets. Oh, okay, that's but where I was But as it turns okay. out, Virginia delegations didn't do their tickets until Sunday. Oh, my gosh. And you literally had to drive to Arlington in order to pick them up. So well, if you're there, you might um, as well just go on. Well, you know, it was just it, the, the the uncertainty about sure. tickets and all this other stuff was. And of course, this is a busy time of year for me too. So I just yes. decided that I would probably rather watch things on television and be nice and toasty warm. Yeah. Um, than to to be sure. up there in the masses. And toasty warm certainly the the order of the day. What did you think? I thought it was a it was really nice. Um, it was interesting to watch all the different people who were gathered, and since uh, I knew a lot of people who went, mm -hmm. um, and to hear what they've said about how it felt to be in that sea of humanity that existed. So I think it was a very well done. Of course, the flubbing of the um, the oath probably was a yeah. little strange, but uh, you know, it was... Note to uh, Chief Justice Roberts, bring your notes next time. Exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's printed in the Constitution. Yeah. The oath is actually in the Constitution, so he could have at least just taken a copy of it. You know, I even I knew it was... I had book. to laugh. You know, uh, my, later. my husband's a clergyman. He's probably done 500 weddings. He still brings the book every yeah. time. <laughs> exactly. You never know. You never know. Pat Murphy, what are your observations uh, about this inauguration? I think anyone that wasn't touched by by the history and, and just by everything that had gone on that led to that moment yes. would have to be a, a mind-numb ideologue yeah. to, to not 
feel what was going on. I mean, it really was a touching ceremony and just everything around it, the people. Now, I'm from Arlington originally, so there was no way I was going near there. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I, was, I was there in 1976 when they had the bicentennial fireworks. It was 3 a.m. before I got home, and that was only a half a million people. So wow. I just So you yeah. said, good, good, I'll, yeah, I'll sit home. Stayed yeah. just like yeah. Vivian, stayed sure. home, nice and warm. Had my cocoa, watched it, it was great. A, a front row seat. How about you, Don Lozada? That's my hometown. And yeah. so it was on a scale that I've never seen before in Washington. I, and I've been to, to like four celebrations and many things on the mall. And, and so I was, I was struck. My, my mother and my brother went and, and they got off very near to the Capitol and had to walk all the way around and couldn't get to the mall until they got to the Washington Monument. And that's a, sort of a trick we play on tourists. Yeah. You know, if you're standing at the Washington Monument, the Capitol looks so close. Well, it's, it's, it's miles. And so for this, you know, this time, the, the natives got the long trip. Yeah. And so your mom, what did your mom say? Um, she said it was really, it was spectacular. Um, I, I, I think she, she's been to these forever, mm -hmm. for 50 years at least. And um, she said that the security was amazing going in. Going back home, she thought there could she could have used a couple more cops <laughs> to help her find her just, way. Just to get yeah. out, just yeah. to get out. Well, you know, the, in, the expectations are, are certainly enormous. And, and one of the things uh, I would just say is just a casual observation was that it, it felt to me, and I want to get your comment on this, it felt to me like some of the media coverage was uh, so uh, filled with adulation that it just felt, I, I mean, I recognize the history of it. I'm not going to, uh, boy, nobody would argue that. But sometimes you can just step back and let the story tell itself. Right. You don't necessarily have to be in the cheerleading section. It felt like there was a lot of cheerleading going on. Uh, I think I have an explanation for that. The 24-hour news channels, which we all mm -hmm. watch, have you seen the movie Speed where Sandra Bullock has to drive the bus and if it goes mm -hmm. under 50 miles an hour it explodes? That's the, that's the ethos behind the 24-hour news channels. If they stop talking, they explode. So, <laughs> so they, they tend to, to hyperbolize yeah. Yeah. indefinitely just to keep things rolling. It always is so interesting yeah. to me, though, because really, if you just kind of step back, it was a grand moment. Let the story yeah, there's itself. just not a lot of perspective. Yeah. You know, there's, yes. There wasn't a lot of perspective in the coverage. It was like this was the first and only inauguration in American history, and it was, it was a remarkable moment. But there just seemed a distinct lack of perspective on how this fit in with the other remarkable moments we've had. I watched. Um, I watched at home, so I have. I have Direct TV. They had a, a special channel set up that had eight different channels on the screen at one time. So I was actually able to watch all of the coverage. It was funny to watch because it was everybody was using the same camera. Yeah. And yeah. scrolling along the bottom, they had you know commentary coming in from ABC or NBC or whoever was doing the call and it, they were all using the same words. Same words, yeah. And so it was really kind of funny to watch yeah. and then when I flip between them because I actually can flip between them and, and hear what I was going it was you're right they could have just as easily let it yeah. pr play itself out and their you know silence sometimes is golden and <laughs> yes. this may have been one of those those times. Yeah you know I, the other thing I thought was interesting about it and uh, I've had conversations with a couple of people around mm. this issue one of the things that I I noticed in the run up to this is and I've never noticed this before is a lot of use of the first names you know it was Barack and Michelle Barack and Michelle or Barack or Michelle I, I, I particularly noticed this from Chris Matthews on MSNBC who's very fond of saying Barack it would be my hope now that we've had the inauguration I mean it wasn't probably so appropriate before but now that we've had this inauguration you, know, you sort of hope that uh, we look at that issue. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I really observe Well, you that. know, I know that, that earlier on and during the primary, there was a concern, some concern about people using first names. But, yeah. you know, our society has become Maybe less and less. Maybe it's just an less, informal thing. Our society certainly is no longer formal. Yeah, I mean, formal. there was a time when when you would not address someone you did not know well by right. any other anything other than Mr. or Mrs. Yeah. You know, last name. And you would never, you know, old Southern thing, you'd never call anybody older than you by their first right. names. I mean, that was the rule. But, uh, you know, that, those so you think days, it's an informality? I think thing, it's an yeah. informality. I think it's an, an, an embrace uh, more of this person is like me as okay. opposed to putting this person on a pedestal. Yeah, yeah. Now, hopefully what that will also translate into is that we don't put people on pedestals and that we actually hold their feet to the fire. Mm. 
which is which brings us right to all of the challenges that face this president and that face this Commonwealth as well. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure it's possible for him to live up to the expectations or what people hope for him. Yeah. I, I hope he does, but I, I think all Americans hope he does. But I, I would suggest that it might actually be impossible. Yeah. There might not be enough time or enough political will to do that. And you brought up the, you, you said that you heard, I've heard you refer to the president by his first name at this table before, and I, and I think you, you're on to something. I think it's, you know, almost a generational thing. It's well, a, he's younger than I am, so I can say that. Yeah. You know, I guess I, I made it very clear that, you know, <laughs> Southerners older than <laughs> you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I will say that uh, Tim Kaine's good friend, Barack Obama, yes. Uh, Tim Kaine, before going up for the festivities and, and the rest of it, uh, had, of course, the State of the Commonwealth Address. And so we'll, uh, we'll check in with some of those remarks, and then we'll come back and talk in just a moment. I come to you tonight in a time of significant national economic distress to talk about how our Commonwealth and our people are faring. Like other states, Virginia is feeling the effects of the national economic recession, which looks like it will be the longest recession since World War II. Citizens are cutting back, they're putting off purchases, and they're stretching their dollars to get through a tight time. At the same time, businesses are struggling. Many are closing or reducing employment. And government agencies, churches, and nonprofit organizations are seeing an increase in demand for services, even as the economy has reduced the tax revenues and the donations that they need to provide those services. Governor Kane speaking to the General Assembly in the State of the Commonwealth Address. And essentially, State of you the said Commonwealth is, is broke. Uh, <laughs> the hole in the budget is about yeah. $4 billion, I think, is where we're going to end up. And it's just, it, there is going to be pain everywhere. And when you say pain everywhere, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, we're talking about reimbursements for Medicaid. We're talking about transportation is zeroed out. I mean, we're not going to build any roads. We're not going to even really have much money to maintain them. I mean, this is, there's going to be a lot of things, a lot of choices that have to get made that are going to mean services are cut. Stuff we depend on the state to do is not going to get done. And we've had this contentious argument about <clears throat> transportation, which now seems to be almost well, nullified. There will be apparently about 800 million coming into the state from the feds, but when they had David Eckern uh, in front of the committee yesterday and they said, what's your priority? He went, oh, well, oh, gee, I don't, he doesn't know. Uh, to me, the problem is VDOT first, fix VDOT, then worry about the funding. You know, when you talk about fixing VDOT, one of the things that we are, we are told is VDOT has been researched. They're delivering projects better now. They're delivering them at budget, well, But But, on you time. know, the, the on time, on budget formula, if a project is not on time and not on budget, it doesn't fit the criteria to be in the formula. So only projects that are on time and on budget go into that formula. So you formula. still see VDOT as a major issue Absolutely. Here. Yeah. They've, won a, they've run a wonderful public relations campaign to try to change their image, but the internal workings of VDOT are still a mess. And a good example, I-64 and, and Mercury Boulevard. Remember how long that went? 77% of her budget, three years past due, and that's VDOT's own figures. Then they turned around, rehired that same contractor to do I-64 and Battlefield Boulevard and Warwick Boulevard and Newport News, and those are all behind schedule. So your feeling is get that fixed first and then take a look. Fixed. The the other piece of this is those six projects we keep hearing about. And we've talked about those right. for a really long time. Uh, in fact, uh, next week we'll be talking about the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the HRPDC yeah. and what that alphabet suit means and why it's important. But it has a lot to do with transportation. Sure. It has a lot to do with sure. the idea that, you know, if you're in Virginia Beach, you have to plan transportation in a way that's cognizant of the entire region. And if we get every penny, every penny in federal stimulus money allocated for every and penny happy. that's coming to Virginia, it's still comes to Hampton Road, it's still not enough still to build enough. one of those projects. No, not sure one. Isn't. So that, right. there's, I, the scale of the problem is so immense that I think we're sort of having trouble figuring out where to start. And so that's why we're looking so much harder at public-private partnerships. So is it fair to say, of those <clears throat> six projects, is it time to, and particularly in the current crunch, is it time to maybe say, maybe those aren't the right six projects, maybe we I think they've already start started over. to do that yeah. at right. the legislative level, where the HRBT, which was not part right. of the six projects, 
but through the legislative process, they're making it one of the projects. Mm -hmm. And of course, it has no money to, to do either. But there again, at the end of the day, there's no money. Right. Yeah. So, so whether it's this six projects or another six projects, what difference does it make? There's no money. Well, I, Pat, I, says Pat, the I, accountant. I, says the accountant. Pat, I have to disagree with you because I, I think having them decide in Richmond, in the legislature, which projects are going to be built is a horrendous idea because it, I, I would much prefer that people who actually study transportation and study the system make make the choices, which is why the HRBT didn't end up on that list. Now, I think you can argue that things have changed, dynamics in the system have changed, and maybe the HRBT needs to be there for political reasons, but not for practical reasons. It doesn't do enough to alleviate traffic. Doesn't well, do but enough. Then to, neither but, does but neither does, does the, the third third crossing, third crossing doesn't so alleviate there's the, traffic there's at the all. There's the argument. Well, the problem. The problem right. is, but it's is part that part of that whole the, it's, it's part and, of a system. I, I, that, yeah, that does. And, I, and I get that. Right. But the but it goes back to government transparency, because we wouldn't be having this <laughs> conversation right, right this one. minute if the MPO and the HRDPC, little bit, alpha, whatever, alphabet soup, had not held those meetings in closed environments yep. without right. public input and voted the way they did. The people need to be more engaged. I, absolutely, and, I and agree so, with you so whether or not whether or not the the, the uh, improvements to the HRBT are going to actually alleviate congestion, as opposed to the third crossing, by not having any public input, by not being transparent, yeah. then what they allow to happen is for people on on all sides of the issue. Right. Yeah. to argue that this is not the case over yeah. here and the information never gets out. And, and thank and, you for but, promoting our show for next week, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't disagree that we need people that are experts in transportation making decisions or at least helping make decisions. And the MPO is supposed to do that, but not in a, in a bubble, Absolutely. not correct. without That's any correct. input. And That's they have correct. completely isolated. And I thought after, after Art Collins left, we would have an opening of the process, and it's gotten worse. They're actually closing it off and wanting to open it up to more unelected people to come in to make these decisions. So the MPO is the problem. And we'll be talking about uh, that with Dwight Farmer uh, uh, from the MPO and some other folks who will be here next week. So that's another reason to tune in next Friday night, no question about it. Uh, the other issue that has been dealt with in the General Assembly has to do, and speaking of this uh, inauguration we've had this week, with the way we vote. Right. And we've all talked about the fact that during the campaign, you know, anything like this where you had state people because we would interview them the state registrars nice nice folks who have worked enormously hard during the election and they just stopped just short of begging you to find a reason to vote yeah. ahead of time one right. of those 17 reasons for which you can file what was then called an absentee ballot essentially sure. early voting is what we're talking about yeah and, and some of our some of our readers have have claimed that because we we advocate early voting we're advocating voter fraud we're, we're saying that people fibbed to vote and they did and they should have because there was real danger but that they shouldn't have to they shouldn't have to yeah. absolutely there you should be able to vote early if you want to not but that's not going to happen this time it's around. not going to happen but but it, the 17 uh, reasons because the bills related the to bill, the allowing bill, that to the happen the bills were all heard at seven o'clock in the morning this past monday which was a holiday um as and you didn't get as the notice turn, till And the notice afternoon. came out, that the uh, itinerary right. came out at 4.30 right. on Friday. Well, there was a um, fix before they ever even it, had the meeting. There was yeah. a fix already in, and the, and the vote was a party line vote. There are six members on that subcommittee, and four of them are Republicans, and two of them are Democrats, and the, yep. and the vote was six to two, vote four to two. I mean, that's just the way it works. There is a there is a problem within the Republican Party that somehow or another believes that if you let people vote early, you're introducing an opportunity for fraud. I don't see how, with the safeguards that we have in place, that you're introducing an opportunity for fraud. You still have to show ID when you show up. There now, I will say this: there, where you have a little room for fraud is the filing of an absentee ballot in one state and the filing of an absentee ballot in another because we don't have a national voter re uh, database. Right. And so you do have that issue, but it's minuscule. And Pat, but you're actually on the same absolutely. side of the Absolutely. The, 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 the process should be trying to get more people to vote. I can understand why the parties 
and their interests don't want more people to vote. But in all honesty, since the voters are paying for this, more people should be brought into the process. I think the 17, 19 days, there's a number of different mm -hmm. uh, bills that are right. in that would open it up. This is ridiculous. There's and no that reason be to be a national conversation about how we vote. I mean, that's the other thing yeah. I think is so interesting. Look, there's so much technology oh, out there. There's states' rights. States' rights ain't going to let that happen. Right. <laughs> but you could have a conversation you can have about a conversation it. Conversation all you want to, but oh, I the, understand the that. But I'm just saying, ain't going to never let that happen. This but, is the point that we. I mean, we. Okay, because every state is dealing with some they are. variation they, they of They are, thing. but but the states. Are, this is going to be one of the issues the states are going to grapple with yeah. and continue to grapple with. And 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 in all honesty, we've always had these issues from one every four years. They've been a little different. This year was a little. It's more a little different because there were more actually more people involved. Four years from now, depending on who's on the ballot, it may not even be an issue again. And Lord knows we could have early voting for the gubernatorial race and it wouldn't be a problem. Can we can we agree that more? democracy is better? Oh, oh, we'll, so we have to leave it there. We will agree the more democracy. I think we would all. Would we all yeah, agree with that? Let me just check yeah. that out. Thanks to all of you for being with us. And we we'll done? check in. Yeah, we're done. Only because here's why. Doing things a little bit differently this week because Kimball Payne is on the job in Richmond. We're going to take a quick break and we'll get him connected by satellite and talk with him about all the goings on in Richmond. We're back in a moment. And Daily Press reporter Kimball Payne joins us from Richmond, where he's been covering the activities of the General Assembly. Kimball, good to talk with you. Always good to be here, Kathy. We're well, there. We're sorry that you're not at our round table or our whatever shape we're calling this triangular table, uh, but we're awfully glad that you're there uh, covering the General Assembly and what, what's going on. One of the uh, one of the messages that we just took out of the conversation with the uh, the rest of your colleagues around the round table is that money is the key issue of the session. Uh, Don Lozado saying that it looked like the state was going to be on the order of four billion dollars in debt before all was said and done. Does that comport with what you're learning in Richmond? Oh, very much so. I mean, those th that four billion dollar figure is is running through everyone's heads. No one's really sure right now. I mean, the two point nine number was two point nine billion was the was the original number original number kicked around. Early February, we'll get more revenue estimates and get a better sense of that. But I think it, it touches everything that we do. I mean, you know, it touches everything the state does. It's public schools coming up here, colleges coming up here talking about tuition increases. You know, the, these these folks we, we, in in medical help. I mean, they're all asking not to be cut, but it, the cuts are coming across the board, and it's just a matter of how big. Do you have the sense? So it sounds like that really is the core of the conversation in Richmond at the moment: is how to make those cuts. All of us in our own private lives have to kind of figure that out. We don't have as much money coming in as we do, uh, as we would like to, for all the things that we would like to pay. So, how, what is the general? mood and do you have a sense based on your reporting about where some of these cuts are most likely to come? Well you you, you get a sense right now the, the, the session's really just ramping up. Martin right. Luther King Day on Monday, the inauguration, Governor Kane getting sworn in for the DNC. I mean there's there's been a lot of distractions early on but what you're seeing now is a lot of the folks that, that get money from the state coming here and testifying and saying this is what will happen if we don't have our money. Uh, and they're, they're talking about everything. They're talking about public education. They're talking about health care, Medicaid. I mean, these were all put on the table by Cain. And if that number grows from $3 billion to $4 billion, well, they're going to keep looking for cuts. I mean, it, it, and, and you kind of get a, get a sense of how far the, uh, everything that the state does goes. I mean, yeah. we were talking with the Virginia Department of Transportation. And they're saying, well, we've got to look at maybe leaving you know, deer carcasses on the road for 48 hours instead of 24, which is our rule right now. I mean, you don't think about these things when you're thinking about state government, yeah. but it touches, you know, everything that you do. Uh, speaking of, the Department of Transportation brings us around to that subject about which we like to talk a lot in Hampton Roads, uh, and we do talk a lot about it. Uh, our roundtable consensus was it really doesn't matter whether the six projects stay on the agenda, whether the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel expansion is added, uh, whether we do anything with the third pro crossing. Because there's no money, all of that is sort of uh, rendered meaningless in some respect. I wonder what you're hearing about transportation in the halls of the General Assembly. 
Well, the, the, the bright side of things, listen, I'm not going to pretend like there's going to be any major breakthrough. Uh, there are some folks talking about it, but it's really lying low right now. But I think the, the one bright spot is the federal stimulus um, right. for, from transportation planning side of things. Uh, you know, they're, they're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 to 800 uh, million dollars for projects in Virginia. Now, the problem is they want shovel-ready projects, and uh, expansion of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, even if they green-lighted it today, is, is five, six years before they can get a shovel in the ground. Same with the third crossing. A lot of these major projects, they want a turnaround in 120 days. So what I think you're going to see, I mean, depending on what Congress puts in rules in place, what you're going to see is smaller projects, bridge replacements, things that can just get, in, get going right now and get moving, get jobs, those are the things where this money is going to go. And Secretary Pierce Homer said there's 1,700 bridges that are you know, functionally obsolete. It's, it's, a, it's a technical term. It doesn't mean they're going to fall down, but it means we've got to put them on a high priority list. And that's where a lot of this money is going to go. And that could be a good thing for Hampton Roads. I mean, we've got a lot of bridges and tunnels that are aging. Uh, no question about it. Certainly a number of projects here. And the question, as you point out, is which of those can get shovel ready the fastest. Uh, and, and that certainly will be uh, where lots of people are focusing attention. Uh, Kimball, listen, thank you so much for joining us. So we'll look forward to seeing you back around the editorial table soon. Uh, but we know you have your work cut out for you for a little while. We're grateful for the updates. You know where to find me. <laughs> Indeed, I do. Thanks so much. That's Kimball Payne reporting from Richmond tonight, where he covers the General Assembly for the Daily Press. You can read his work in the pages of the Daily Press or, of course, online at dailypress.com. He can also be found blogging at shadplank.com. And we'd like to hear what you think the administration should be tackling this time around, the administration in Washington and the administration in Richmond. Gives a, a letter at 5200 Hampton Boulevard, Norfolk, Virginia, 23505. Call us at 889-9437 or email us at whatmatters at whro.org. You can also check out our website at whatmatters.tv and that's where you can sign up for our weekly EBIT, which will let you know what we're working on for upcoming broadcasts. Well, speaking of upcoming broadcasts, next week we dip our spoon into the alphabet soup that is regional planning and when it's all over, we hope you'll know the HRPDC from the MPO and more importantly we'll explore why they the work that they do matters and why some citizens are looking for more input in the process all that and more next week thanks for watching